and Savior Jesus Christ, you have given us your Son, the only thing imaginable, Father, that could even begin to start this conversation of salvation is Jesus Christ is our only hope. And your word says that you've demonstrated your love for us in this while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That you so loved us, Father, that you gave your one and only Son so that whosoever believed in you would not perish but have everlasting life. Your word says, Lord, that to all who call on his name, to all who believe in him, that you give the right to become sons and daughters of the living God. Father, your grace is immeasurable. Your love is immeasurable. At the same time, Father, you are a just, a holy, and a righteous God. And while Jesus satisfied your justice on that cross for all who believe in him, there are those, Father, all over this world, and there are some, no doubt, here today who have not yet received that free gift, who have not yet placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And because of that, Lord, they are racing towards your justice. Your wrath still upon them. And Father, they may not understand that, but I pray that your spirit would open their eyes today to understand that Jesus Christ is their only hope. And Father, for us, all of us here who would say, oh, I'm a Christian, Lord. We just sang about bowing down to you, and we sing and we worship, but Father, I pray that our faith would not be just about Sundays, but it would be an everyday walk with you because that's what you saved us to. You've saved us, Lord, that we might present ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to you. So, Father, you have business with all of us today. There are those that have yet to receive this gift. I pray that today would be that day. Holy Spirit, I ask and I plead that you would draw people to the living Christ today. And for all of us, Lord, who say, oh, I'm a Christian, I pray that you would, Holy Spirit, impress upon our hearts that we are not part-time believers, that we are to be full-time followers of the one who saved us. Lord, I pray that you be glorified this day. As we open your word, I pray that your spirit would take your word and apply that word to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. <coughs> It's good to see you, um, and this was not uh, a part of what I intended to, but just very briefly, I want you to look around, and I want you to notice something that's very important here. Don't stare because you'll freak some people out, but you can just look around. No one's looking around. Please look around. Now you're making me feel uncomfortable. There you go. See? Okay. Um, as we have talked this year and prayed this year about moving towards two and two, we are far beyond what's called the 80% rule. And by that, two worship studies, two Bible studies, and some people say, oh no, we can't do that. We can't break up our holy huddle. I hate to break it to you, but it's not about us. And I need you to hear your pastor's heart. I have zero desire in growing anything here for my name. I don't desire to build my resume. That's not my concern, but I am very concerned about the kingdom of God. And the real question for those of us who are members of Stonebridge Baptist Church is, are we willing to adapt and accommodate so that perhaps another 100 to 110 people can come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and find community? If we're not, then we have real problems. I'll just put it to you that way. But I know that we are, because I've heard so many of your stories and so many of your hearts. And I want to ask you today, as you look around, to pray, to keep praying. Because the Lord has something for this church. And I'm excited to see what that is. I don't know about you. This reminds me as we're on the 15th anniversary of 9-11, if you'll remember. And how many of you can, and, and some of you are young, so you, you can't. But how many of you remember exactly where you were and everything right in watching and trying to process, correct, what's taking place? And probably a lot of us were in that mode where we heard the story at first and thought, oh my, it's terrible. Perhaps a Cessna flew into one, you know, one of those towers and then all this starts to happen and we can't believe what we're seeing. And what we saw in the church 
in America, there was literally a three-week spike. People flooding to church. People were looking for answers. People knew, man, there's something really wrong and something wrong with me. There's something wrong with everything and I, I need hope. And then three weeks later, literally three weeks later, everything went back to normal. How tragic. At times I wonder what it will take in our culture and I pray. I pray that it is actually a, a great awakening and not a greater tragedy. What will it take to get our attention that we need the Lord Jesus? We desperately do. <coughs> And what will it take for us as Christians to recognize that we're called to shine? We're called to shine. Yes, this world is dark. But the Lord Jesus has overcome the darkness. When you're a Christian, you're going to stand out. And by that, I don't mean in some weird or strange way that in which you behave. And I also don't mean that you stand out just because I wore a Christian t-shirt or I've got the fish on my car. How many times have you been cut off by someone who's got the, the fish on their car, you know, and they're driving crazy and you're going, hey, please take the fish off your car. You're giving us a bad name, okay? And just stop that. So just having the bumper sticker, having the cross, having the fish, having a t-shirt, having uh, the plaque on your door that says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Those are all nice, but those do not in any way, shape, or form mean that you're actually a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and that you belong to Him. When you are a child of God, you're going to stand out, and at times that can be scary, at times that may be very uncomfortable, at times that will cause you to have these things where you have to make a decision right then there at that moment whether you're going to stand and you're going to, to, to shine or you're going to shrink back and, and blend in. I've shared some stories with you and I just won't get into all the longness of this story but I never will forget that I, I, and, and, and by God's grace one day we'll be doing that here too. I really enjoyed when I was at Eisenhower that one of the things that we started doing was we just started sending people out in the neighborhoods and people kept thinking that well, is there some kind of a, what's the catch? Uh, hi, we're your neighbors from Eisenhower Road Baptist Church. We're just here to let you know we love you, we care about you, anything we can do for you, anything we can pray for you about. They kept waiting for the shoe to drop. Well, we had so many amazing conversations and one day I will tell you all this leave you with this, but you know God is working when you find yourself being asked by a, a, a Vietnam vet as he is willing in and he's got his can of beer here and he smells like pot into his apartment. Hey, preacher, could you come tell these folks what you just told me? And you walk in and there's bongs and there's pot smoke everywhere and all these people, and you get to share the gospel. You know, some of you are saying, oh, I can't believe you walked in there. I got to share the gospel. <laughs> okay? So, you know, and I'm that to say. Yeah, I was freaked out, and I thought, I got to go back to prayer meeting. <laughs> They're going to smell me, <laughs> right? But while we're doing all of that, across the street, there's a shell station, there's a food mart, and there is a very sketchy tax office. And, at the, and all three are owned by Muslims, okay? Samir is a very nice man, and he's a somewhat secular Muslim, and he is the shell man. And so we would always go by and just check on our neighbors. We would check on our store owners, too. The one man, Salim, from the very sketchy tax office, I always had this very strange sense when I would walk over there uh, that there was something very dark, almost tangible. And I, by that I mean it was, he not only hated me, but there was something else. I mean, there was just some dark stuff. And the first time I encountered it, I thought, oh, wow, Lord, you know, whatever this is, you got to deal with this. So one day I'm over at the Shell station, he's, and, and sent my, my, my nice Muslim friend Samir said, hey, Kevin, uh, I appreciate what you're doing. You know, we have different faiths. I need you to stay away from Salim. He's a very bad man. He does not like you walking around doing this. He doesn't like your church walking around. Please keep your members away from this. Do not do this. He says, I stay away from him. Now, mind you, this is when we have, there were FBI and Homeland people in our parking lot who were, they said, we're just watching some things across the street. Wow. Okay? Now, we go out every Wednesday. Do I still go out and do I still go right across the street or do I shrink back in fear? You see, some of you, again, believe that the pastor lives in a magical world where I never encounter anything, but that's absolutely false. The Lord impressed upon me, no, you're still going to go. And you're going to show him my love. He never really did embrace me. But he did start to back off a little bit. I don't think he knew what to do with the gospel. 
I don't think you know what to do with love. Or another instance in which standing out, and this may be where a lot of you can say, oh yeah, I get that. You're in a place. In this case, it was in the gym. I'm in the gym and I see there's, you know, these two very large men who were talking in by large. I mean, one of these guys just looks like, like a, I don't know, like 6'6". Six, six. He's huge. He's a huge man. And he's talking to another guy who's also huge. Only this guy is like the, you know, I'm on steroids huge. And they're, they're arguing back and forth. And the steroids huge guy starts to, ar starts to argue a little bit with the other man. And they're talking about Christianity. And the other guy, the steroid man, is talking about the strangest conspiracy theories. I mean, we're talking about UFOs, and we're talking about Jesus and the Bible, and how white man and the European, they're both African-American gentlemen, how the white man Europeans have distorted all this stuff, man, and it ain't true, and it's all, he was in on the know, and this other guy didn't know anything of the gospel, so you're in the room, let me ask you a question. Do you sit there, and do you hear all this stuff, and do you go... Okay, these guys are really getting kind of intense, and this is really weird. I'll just kind of leave. Or do you walk over and say, excuse me, I uh, couldn't help but to overhear a conversation. And do you mind uh, if I'm a Christian? Can we just talk a little bit about the gospel? What do you do? I know a lot of people say, oh, yeah, I go talk the gospel. I'm asking you, what do you do? What do you do in your context? Do you shine or do you hide? We're in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus does not give us the option of shrinking back. He does not give us the option of, 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 of pulling away. Matthew chapter 5. Today we're simply looking at this idea that you are light. If you are a child of God, if you're a Christian, you are light. We've walked through the Beatitudes and we're now in the similitudes and that means that we are uh, similar to certain things. Last week we saw that Jesus said that we were similar to salt. We'll review this. Um, and you remember in the larger context of things that we had, a, that Jesus follows this on the heels of that beatitude in which he deals with persecution. So let's walk it all the way back to Matthew 5, 11. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. We saw in those latter Beatitudes dealing with persecution that Jesus knows that it would be easy for his disciples to shrink back and we see early on that they do that and they do that pretty severely so. We see that in light of Jesus' teaching the temptation would be to shrink back to not engage the lost world for fear of reprisal to not stand out. But Jesus says to all of us who are his children no you you have a role in this all of this you cannot and must not and you will not shrink back because you are my children yes we saw last week the world's decaying and rotting and living in this sense of, of spiritual uh, decay and yet Jesus says that we are to be influence, influencers preserving agents salt and today we're going to see that while this world may be living and plunging itself into further darkness that you and I are called to influence by being light Matthew 5, 14 through 16, you, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Spiritual darkness, I'm not telling you anything you already don't know. The spiritual darkness in our culture is very real. It's palpable. It's tangible. You can see it all around you. You can see it in the futility, the way that people think, and the harshness 
and it's the way people treat one another. You can see the spiritual death all around you, people stumbling around, looking for some kind of direction for something that might work on some level. That's the world that we live on, and it's live in rather, and it's looking for all sorts of answers anywhere but the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the only answer to our greatest need. And Jesus says, you, in this dark world, you are the light of the world. In other words, there's no going undercover here. You can't, you can't, you, you can't do that. It was like last week we saw that salt has to get out of the salt shaker. You can't shrink back. Jesus is saying, you are the light of the world. Light stands out. <laughs> How many of you have ever been in a cave and they've done that great thing where they turn all those little electrical lights off and it's pitch black and you can't see your hand? That's amazingly dark. Dark, 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 dark. What does it take to pierce the darkness? Does it take a, do we have to get one of those really big high beams? You can light a simple candle. The darkness is dispelled. Because some of you right now, I say that because some of you have bought into the lie, well, who am I? I'm a one of consequence. I'm not a speaker. I'm not, you know, influential or whatever that may be. So what can I do? No, no, no. You, if you belong to the Lord Jesus, are a child of the living God. And as you yield to his spirit, as you abide in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will use you to shine into this darkness. It's not about what you can do in your strength. It never has been. That's the lie Satan continually tells us. It's not about me and my strength. It's not about me and my wisdom. It's not about you and your strength. It's not about you and your wisdom. It's about the power of God working in and through us. You remember that song you sang when you were a child, right? This little what? Oh, yeah. And you're a little kid. I'm going to let it shine. Are you? Or did you forget that somewhere along the way with flannel board Jesus? You can light one candle and the darkness is dispelled. Light cannot be hidden when it's shining. Well, there's some functions of light in the context that Jesus is using here. First of all, light reveals. Light reveals what is true. It also reveals what's false. The gospel does this. The word of God does this. Jesus himself does this. An example here, if you want to distinguish truth between error... You don't spend your time on YouTube watching conspiracy videos. You read the Word of God. And you read it in context, okay? You read this. How does a counterfeit expert know how to distinguish between a counterfeit bill and a true dollar bill? He gets to know what really well? The real dollar bill. You need to know this Word <laughs> so you won't be led astray. Jesus talked about himself in terms of light. In John 8, 12, and you can write this down, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, some of you, if you're thinking, you're going, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Is Jesus confused? Because you just said that he said that we're the light of the world, and he just said here that he's the light of the world. So what's going on? Very simple. Here's the deal. Ultimately, in the truest and fullest sense, Jesus is the light of the world, and we as his children, we're to reflect him. We're to reflect him. People are to see Jesus in us. That light. Do they see him in you? Well, let's me come to terms with this. We, we, we're faced with, again, this issue of persecution. You see, Jesus never shied away. And I think this is so important for us. And the Gospels never shy away. The New Testament, the Old Testament, nothing in the Word of God ever shies away from the idea that the people of God will suffer opposition. Listen to what John said in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and then we'll skip verses 9 through 13. Speaking of Jesus and how the world received him. 
and what it has to say about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made in Him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I pray you remember that. <laughs> the darkness cannot, will not, will never overcome the light. Okay? The true light, verse 9, which gives light to everyone, speaking of Jesus, was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. That's the world today, is it not? It's always been the story of our race, of people. We don't even recognize our own creator because we're spiritually dead. He came to his own. His own did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of the will nor of the flesh uh, uh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It says here in this text a few big things. One, Jesus is the light of the world. In him is life. And his life is light to the world. And he gives light to all. But because the world loves darkness and is in darkness, it opposes him. But the darkness does not win. The darkness cannot overcome him. It cannot overcome the light. Cannot overcome, therefore, us as his children. For we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. Do you believe that? The darkness is so bad in this world system that our creator comes to us and in our state of spiritual death and darkness, we did not recognize him. In fact, we opposed him at every turn. We killed him. But this was all the Lord's doing, sending the son and the, the son of God willingly laying his life down to rescue us from our bondage to Satan, sin and death, to drag us out of the darkness and into the light to set us free. And Jesus does this, and now he says to us, shine, reflect me, so that others living in darkness will see, so that others who are in the darkness might be set free. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Now, if we're going to be the light of the world, how are we going to do this? How are we going to shine? Let me give you a few things. Same application points as last week. If you're going to be salt, one, we're going to have to abide in the Lord Jesus Christ. Apart from him, we can do nothing. We're going to need to be shaped by the Word of God. Romans 12, 1 and 2. We're going to need that the Word of God transform our thinking. As we walk through Scripture, we see that light is a very important motif in Scripture. And we don't have time to explore all of them. So if I miss one of your favorites today and I'm bound to, please forgive me. But I want to give you a few things to consider regarding light, about being light, what the Word has to say about light. Write this down or you'll see them on the screen. Psalm 36, 9. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. We find life itself. We see clarity and light for living in the Lord himself. 1 John 1, 5 through 7. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. God is light, meaning he's holy. He's absolutely pure. There is not a hint or a, 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 a stain of sin within him. There is no darkness. And if we who claim to be his children prefer to walk in darkness and not the light, then we're lying, the word says, and the truth is not in us. Us. This is not teaching perfectionism. It's the idea of perpetually walking, continually walking in the darkness. Here's the reality, folks. Just like you can't be hot and cold at the same time, you cannot walk in the light and the darkness at the same time. You can't do it. A lot of Christians try. Professing Christians try. I'll come in the light on Sunday. I'll ease back into things during the week. I'll come into the light when I need something. But then I'll shrink back where I was before. We can't live that way. That's not taking up your cross and following Jesus. That's called what we would call cultural Christianity. That's not Christianity. But if we walk in the light, the word says, we have fellowship with him, with one another, and the truth is in us. So are you walking in the light? 
Back to the Word of God, Psalm 119, 105 says, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. If you want to know what the Lord is calling you to do, what the Lord is calling, how He's calling you to live, you spend time. He's spoken. It says of the Word that all Scripture is God-breathed. These are not just words by dead men. These are words spoken by God. This is His Word. How many times over the years I've heard people say or ask questions like, gee, I don't know. And I'll just give a typical example of one that uh, I've run into all too many times, often in premarital counseling. Well, we're living together and, uh, you know, yes, we're both. Yes, we're both Christians. Amen. Amen, brother. Yes, pastor. Yes, pastor. And uh, no, yes, we are. No, we are um, living together and uh, we, we do plan on getting married, but we love each other. Well, I don't doubt that you love each other. What does the Word of God say? Oh, oh we love each other. No, that's, what does the Word of God say? See, one of the things that you'll find is that it seems oftentimes we're only comfortable walking into the light or the areas where light is shining as long as it's not exposing much that we don't want to have touched. You ever had a painful thing that you, if someone touched it, you're like, ah, don't touch that. <laughs> A lot of us are that way spiritually. We've got little pockets of darkness and we don't want the Word of God to touch that. It's like, no. I'm going to live that part of my life on my terms. Christianity 101. If you're going to walk with the Lord, you must spend time in His Word. God's Word is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates the very deepest part of who we are. It's always relevant. I don't have to make it relevant. It's always relevant no, relevant no matter what the time, no matter what, what the age, no matter what the circumstances, because the Word of God is timeless, and it's always applicable to where we live. We know what God expects of us when we read His Word. It's like a light to our feet as we walk in a dark world. His Word gives us wisdom and guidance and truth. There's so many light images in Scripture, too many to list, but the ultimate imagery of light is ultimately found in Jesus. Jesus came to shine light for all who were living in darkness, the darkness of death, and light serves this glorious purpose to shine, and Jesus is God's blazing torch that stands and shines throughout the ages, and Jesus says to His children, reflect my my light to one another, or to other people. Are you doing that? Are you shining? Jesus goes on to say, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. He continues now with new imagery. A city that's seated on a hill is there for all to see. In Jesus' day, as you would approach that city, that city would stand out just like it would today. A city on a hill. By day, you would see houses and buildings and trees. They would all stand out because it's on a, a hill. At night, as people lit lamps in their homes, the lights would shine brilliantly throughout that Middle Eastern desert on that city on a hill. And Jesus says, my people are to be like that. You stand out. You shine. Do you see how difficult it is for us to even rationalize that whole I'm the deep undercover Christian. You just can't. You, you, you can't. He died to set us free. He gave everything to cover all of our sin, shame, and guilt. He gave us life. He rescued us from that which we deserve and called us into relationship with Him. And He says, take up your cross, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And a lot of us are like, no, I, I like the being able to ask you for things part and the going to heaven part, but not the other stuff. And I'll just lay low. That's cultural Christianity. That's not what you see here. Now, something very important we need to note. Jesus says that we are to stand out and we do so not to get attention. We're going to see that later here in, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, not today. We stand out because we live differently. We think differently. We think so differently that we're like a city on a hill that can't be hidden. We live so differently. We're like a city on a hill that 
can't be hidden. That's what the Lord expects of us. That's what we're confronted with in our, in our, in our culture. So every time that we desire to blend in or to hide, we must remember that we were saved to glorify the Lord. We were saved to serve him. We were saved to shine. We were saved to bless humanity. You're saved to make disciples. You're, see, you're saved, brother, to lead others out of darkness. You were saved to be that bright spiritual reference point for those who were living in darkness that they would know the truth. So how are you doing with that? How are we doing with that? Do others see Jesus in you? Or do they see someone from their perspective that's just like them, only you just happen to go to something called church once a week? Jesus keeps hammering home. As you walk through this, we see just how emphatically he is speaking, how much he is ex preparing and expects his disciples and us to live and serve him in a world that's not going to love us. And I think so many of us have heard this text so much, we just don't think much about it. It's like, yeah, 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 I know that. Those are texts we really need to hang out because do, just because you really know it up here doesn't mean that it's actually taken root here. He continues, nor do people light a lamp put under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Another image and another call to do not shrink back. You can't shrink back. You're not to hide. If someone walked into a dark room and lit a candle and then put a basket over it, you might say, why? Why would you do that? We, we need the light. But a lot of us do that every single day. Well, I'm going into work now. Basket over self. <laughs> I'm going into school now. Basket around myself. Grocery store, school, work, neighborhood. Shine. Shine. But, but some people may not like that. Some people may not like me. That's right. Some people might oppose me. That's right. But guess what? For those who shine and those who walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, God's going to use you to profoundly impact someone who desperately needs the Lord Jesus. Are you willing to take ten insults that one person perhaps might come to faith in Christ? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to take a couple of threats so that someone else might hear the gospel? Where do you draw the line to say, no, I'm not, I'm putting the bushel over this light right now? Or are you at that point to where you say, I don't care if they do whatever they do to me. I want you to be glorified in my life. Because that's where Jesus calls us to be. They can kill your body, but they can't take your soul. <laughs> you need to remember that. We are not saved and called to be light in order that we might hide. Jesus saves us and then says, I'm going to put you on a stand, so to speak, so that you will shine and illuminate all around you, that your words, your actions, your deeds would shine, that you would share the gospel. All of these matter. And Jesus says, shine brightly. Do not hide what I have done for you. And he concludes this section on being an influence. In verse 16, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do you see the purpose here? We shine and we, we do this not to draw attention to ourselves, right? That's not what it's about. Otherwise, Jesus would have said, so that they might see your good works and give you the glory. It's not about us. It never will be. It's about him and his glory. Okay? So that all that we think and all that we do, it's for the glory of God. It's not about us. We do not do the saving. We cannot save. We are not the hope for humanity. This is about the gospel. It's about God's plan. It's about him sending his son to redeem lost humanity that we would live as we were intended for his glory. And lost humanity cannot give glory to God because lost humanity has no interest in glorifying God. But when they come into the light, when they are saved, now it is possible to live for his glory and to live as life 
has always been intended in relationship with God. So when Jesus says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven, it's understood that, one, our lives are going to point people not towards ourselves, but to Jesus. Does your life point people to Jesus? Two, our words are to point people to Jesus. And I'm not telling you to run around preaching at people at your work, okay? I'm not telling you to run around doing that. What I am saying is be open, be ready, be available, be sensitive, be able to say, Lord, here I am. If you want to use me, I'm ready. Don't shrink back. The Lord wants us to show people this better way to live that is in relationship with Him, how we were created to live, not again for our glory, but for the glory of God. When we look at this section, we're confronted with a lot of things as we think of salt and light. And we'll conclude with these reminders. One, in order to be the people the Lord has called us to be, we must come into contact with lostness. We cannot preserve what we do not come into contact with. You can't. We cannot be separatist, isolationist. We cannot retreat or shrink backward to shine brightly. And when we shine, the Lord is going to use that light of the Lord Jesus shining through us to draw some to himself. But you should expect that when you shine, that you're going to attract some who are very opposed to the gospel. And we've talked about that for several weeks, have we not? And I will say this, when you shine, you should expect at times some weird things to happen. <laughs> Sometimes people just come out of the world works and are not going to like you. There's a pastor I served under in Houston, and it was, it was a great thing. Cause he, 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 no, he's a good guy. And um, there were some neat things happening in the life of our church. We were seeing the Lord move in some, some really cool ways. And um, at the same time, we were seeing some really strange things happen. And by strange, I mean, we're just, you know, there was pockets of hostility and things that, would, that were just, it, it was strange. Everything was amplified. And he, he, we were in the car. He made us, we always have these three to four hour long staff meetings every Tuesday. But we got to eat lunch and he'd say, well, doc, you know, the brighter the light, the more bugs you attract. Did you catch that? <laughs> I said, yeah. That's true. When you shine, those who are in darkness, there will be those who are desperate for the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're going to see that, and they will be drawn to you, but you're going to attract a few bugs along the way. Sometimes those bugs are not the nuisance type of like the moth flitting around, but sometimes they're pretty, pretty rough. They're not going to like you. Will you shrink back when that comes, not if, but when? Or will you say, Lord, give me grace to stand, give me grace to shine? Are you shining? Will you shine? Have you come into the light yourself? And if you say you have, are you walking in the light now? We're going to have a word of prayer followed by a time of invitation. The invitation is a continuation of, of our worship. The invitation is an opportunity for each of us to respond to the Lord's work in our life. Some of us may be here this morning and This whole talk of light and darkness, you're going, wow, I, that's, that's me. <laughs> I need Jesus. The good news is Jesus offers relationship with him. He offers forgiveness of sins as a free gift because he paid for all your sins, all my sins on the cross. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. You come to him just as you are and say, Lord, here I am. Have mercy on me. I received this gift, and he washes you up and cleans you up as white as snow. And you might be saying, but, 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 Pastor, you don't know the things I've done. And I would say, you don't know how great his love and grace is. It's greater than anything you've ever done. 
for some of us today, that's the most significant thing. It's to say, you know what, I, I, I want to give my life to Jesus and I don't know where he's going to lead me, but I know he's worth everything. And if that's you, when we stand and sing, I'm going to ask for you to be very courageous. Would you mind leaving where you're, you're, you're standing and singing? And if you would just come forward, and if you would let me know, I, I want to give my life to Jesus. What is that? We'll share and we'll talk. We'll set up a time to meet. Leave her today a changed person, okay? Others of us, perhaps the Holy Spirit has impressed upon you that you're to shine. And maybe you've been an expert at knowing how to put that basket on and off throughout the week and the Lord is saying no you're going to shine all the time I want you to stand for me and some of us might need to recommit ourselves to the Lord Jesus today and say Lord here I am no matter what the cost be glorified in me you too please come forward I'd be more than glad to pray with you or if you just want to come up here and pray by yourself you can do that others if you're looking for a church home and you believe that this is where the Lord would want you to plant yourself Please come forward and I'll be glad to share with you to say, oh, I'd like to join the church. And we'll set up a time to meet. And we'd be honored to have you journey with us. Okay? However you need to respond, I pray that all of us would just say, oh, Lord here. Yes, Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you because I know that I once was lost. And now I'm found. I was not found because I was smarter than others or more spiritual than others. I was found because the Lord Jesus saved me. And Lord Jesus, you called me out of the darkness and into the light. And I can't boast in this. That was you and your doing. And now you bid me come and follow day by day by day. Lord, you know that I am also still in process. And if we're all honest here, Lord, those of us who profess your name, we're to shine a lot more brightly than we do. I just ask that during this time of invitation, Lord, that you would capture our hearts in such a way and that we would respond to you in such a way that brings you glory. That if there is someone here today who needs to give their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, that today would be that day. And for all of us, Lord, who say that we're Christians, that today would be the day that we say, Lord, I want to shine no matter the cost. Lord Jesus, be glorified. I pray this in your precious and holy name. Amen.